In this lesson, we're going to go over some valve repair scenarios. The first one is water leaking from a head. A single valve won't operate. A single valve is stuck on or a single valve has low pressure. But first, let's talk about the decision to rebuild or replace a valve. Okay, let's talk about replacement. Now, there are a few older valve models that just don't warrant rebuilding. When you see these models, just save your time and effort and immediately start working to cut out and replace the valve. Now, I'm not going to give you a list of the models that I personally have problems with. It may seem disparaging, you know, in some way to those manufacturers, but mostly it's just old models that are out of production. There are some that just gave a problem, you know, even when they were in production and, you know, and you could get the valve. But, you know, instead, if you're working as a technician, just pay attention to the patterns out in the field and make your own list of rebuild or replace. And there's no shame whatsoever in cutting a valve out and replacing it with a new reliable model instead of rebuilding the valve two or three times and still being unsure of its reliability going forward. Okay, now what about rebuilding a valve? Okay, if you've gone through your troubleshooting sequence and you've determined that the solenoid's bad, just replace it. No big deal. Don't mess with anything else. Just replace the solenoid and drive on. No big deal. Turn off your main water supply first, though. For a lot of valves that, you know, you're going to need to have the water supply off and some, you know, the, the pressure is so high that you may cross thread your solenoid putting it back on. Some are easy, some are not, you know, to do. And like the hunters, it'll definitely, there's a lot of pressure shooting out that little small hole down here in your solenoid attachment pit. So when you've worked through your troubleshooting methodology, you've determined that, say, the diaphragm or the spring or something isn't working correctly, I recommend a total rebuild, meaning that everything that can be removed off your lower valve body is just removed and replaced. Now, it's quite possible just to replace the diaphragm, you know, or the spring or whatever it is and return the valve to service, but years of experience as a contractor has shown me the error to that thinking. It's generally cheaper to buy the entire valve than to purchase the diaphragm or the solenoid or the components separately, if you can even buy them separately. And since the cost of the valves is pretty reasonable, there's no reason not to replace everything while you're there. While you've got the valve dug up, opened up, why not just replace everything that you can? And if you're a contractor that warranties your work, you're going to be held responsible for the performance of that valve into the near future. So why risk a callback? Why risk losing your profit on that operation, on that service call, by just not replacing all the components of the valve while you're there and you've got it broke open? Okay. So let's, you know, take a walk through some of the most common valve-related issues. You know, water leaking from a sprinkler. Right? You get calls say, hey, a valve's leaking, I've got water leaking from a sprinkler. And this is an issue that we get calls for pretty often. But your first question has to be, is it leaking all the time or just when the zone is running? Okay. If the leak is only, occur uh, if the leak is only occurring while the zone is running, while that head is running, then it's a, it's a head problem. Replace the head. But water leaking constantly, and I mean 24-7 from your sprinkler, normally indicates two things. The first thing is that, that the sprinkler that it's leaking from is probably the lowest head and elevation on the zone. And the second thing is that it's the valve that's leaking and not the sprinkler. So, you know, sometimes a valve will get a particle lodged in between the diaphragm and its seat, or maybe the diaphragm itself is damaged or torn, and a small amount of water is leaking through, and it'll flow through the pipes to the lowest head, start to build up, and then it'll start to dribble out. Now, this is assuming that the head doesn't have a check valve in it, okay? I've seen other contractors trying to address this problem by putting a check valve on that lowest head that's leaking. Well, guess what? The water just backs up to the next lowest head in elevation and starts to leak from that. I mean, I suppose you could put check valve heads on every single one on the zone to stop it, and then none of them would leak unless the pressure built up past the threshold of the check valve, which is usually 8 to 10 PSI. And a lot of times leaks ain't going to allow that much pressure to build up. But regardless, it's the valve that needs to be addressed and not the heads. Okay. Now, a single zone isn't operating, right? 
first ask enough questions of your homeowner or property manager or whoever it is. All right. So how long has this been going on? Has the system been used often? Has it been off for the season, for the winter, or has it been off for years? All right. Has there been any construction or work of any kind happening on the property? Especially, you know, cable, utility work, have phone lines, new cable lines been installed? Has there been any new plants installed by your landscaper or have they dug any new bed edging in? You know, make sure that all of your other zones are working properly and that water is flowing normally into the system. Don't just take the homeowner's word for it. Go check and make sure everything's running properly, right? So, you know, we're going to troubleshoot our timer settings first. Run through a quick check of all your settings. And in my opinion, that's something that you should do at the start of every service call or system inspection. You now, and make sure that there's runtime set on that zone. Somebody may have turn, turn, turned the runtime to zero and that's why it's not coming on. But now turn the zone on from the timer and walk the property and check for any leaks that may be occurring. Use your eyes and your ears on this. Listen. Now give it a few minutes to see if any water bubbles up to the surface. And during this time while you're waiting, try to determine where the valve is and walk your suspected pipe path between your water source and the valve, and then from your valve out into the zone looking for leaks on the zone pipes. Look, anything leaking anywhere, really. Now go back to the timer. While the zone is still on and running at the timer, use your multimeter to measure the voltage on that circuit and then check the rest of the circuits as well while you're there. So if you get any voltage on any of the other circuits that shouldn't be running, then there can be two problems happening. Like either the timer has a problem inside of it or there's wires touching out in the field or somehow otherwise allowing voltage to be fed back through the other zone wires. To determine if it's the timer, mark the wiring diagram or take your phone out and snap a picture of the terminal strip to make sure you can put your wires back in the correct place. Now and take the wires off. Turn the timer to, you know, first turn your timer to the off position and now remove all your wires, okay? Now manually turn that zone on from the timer and recheck the voltage on that zone and then check your other terminals as well. If you're still getting voltage across more than one zone, you've got a bad timer. There's a short somewhere on the circuit board. Replace it. And if not, then there's wiring problems. The wiring bundle may have been cut through with a shovel and the wires are still close enough so the electricity is still jumping the gap enough to be measured at the timer all right, but not enough to actually run that zone or whatever. But maybe a valve box is filled up with water and all of the wire connections that are inside that valve box are exposed in some way. Maybe they didn't have wire nuts put on them or maybe they didn't use grease filled wire nuts. Now this can cause electricity to feed back along the other wires back into the timer. Now assuming that all the voltage checks are okay, turn off your timer ensure there's no current flowing, and now let's check the resistance of that circuit in question with our ohm setting on our multimeter. Now also check all the other zone circuits at this time to try to get an idea of what the normal resistance reading is going to look from all of our other um, ostensibly operational zone circuits. And it helps to know what kind of valves that you've got on the system so that you can know how many ohms to expect from a, a healthy operational solenoid. Now, and remember when you're checking this circuit here, remember that the circuit's going to show the resistance of the solenoid plus the wires going out and back plus maybe one or two ohms at most for the circuit inside the timer. Now, if you get abnormal resistance readings, disconnect the wires for that circuit, check the resistance across the timer terminals, and now measure the ohms across our two disconnected wires. I recommend you know using the little clamps to do so so that your body isn't messing with it. Now if the ohms are too low, there's either a short in the wiring or in the solenoid itself. If the ohms are pretty high but not infinite, it may be the solenoid going bad or it could be a corroding wire splice at the solenoid or somewhere in between that's causing you know an intermittent kind of connection. If the ohms are infinite, meaning they're pe pegged out high, then the solenoid could be uh, bad or that the wire circuit is open somewhere, a broken wire. Check your wire connections at the solenoid first and then try to determine otherwise. 
Now reconnect all of our wires if necessary and start that zone up again with the timer. The zone in question, of course. Now go out to the valve. Let's do an eyeball check of the valve. Is there a leak? Was the valve installed correctly? Right? If the valve or system was just installed, there may be some glue that was pushed inside of here and is now interfering with that little pilot tube underneath there. Here's a trick. You know, you can take a flag and push it down in there to see if that tube is being blocked. Now, you can't do that with every valve, but for sure there are some common valves that, that you can check like that, especially Hunter. Now, we're going to try to turn the valve on. We're going to try to actuate it by opening up our bleed screw or by partially cracking open our solenoid. If the valve doesn't come on, you'll hear it come on. You've got a, a mechanical problem with the valve itself. Rebuild the valve or replace it if necessary. Now, if the valve did turn on while using the bleed screw, right? So continue to check the solenoid. Uh, are we receiving voltage out to the solenoid? You can use your multimeter to check the voltage at your wire splices. Take the, the wire nuts off, wipe the grease off, and check it there. And if unsure, turn the timer off, disconnect your wire splices, restart your timer on that zone, and come back out here to the disconnected wires and check the voltage on those zone wires. If that looks good, now we need to determine if the solenoid itself is the issue. If you've got a Station Master handy, I recommend you get a Station Master Pro. You can connect it here and turn it on and it'll apply a voltage to the solenoid. If you don't hear it click, if the solenoid doesn't actuate, now just replace the solenoid, wire it back up, and recheck your operation from the timer. Hopefully it'll come on. Now, if the valve was coming on when we had it opened up manually, and the solenoid and electric circuit have checked out good, we've got a more complex problem. You know, you should be able to hear or, you know, feel water passing through the valve if it's running normally. And if you heard it open up and you think there's water running through it, but no water coming out the heads, then recheck, recheck for a leak somewhere in the zone. Now we need to check for obstructions in the piping system. Now this is a factor that can't easily be tested for. You basically have to eliminate all of your other possibilities. And if you've done that, now get out a garden hose. Right? Hook it up, unscrew the furthest head, and use an adapter to connect your garden hose connection to your NPT you know, fittings here. Turn your water on and back pressure the zone. And you may have to take off maybe the nearest head on the zone or even disconnect the valve so that you can flush water and see if there's anything down in there and hopefully flush out the obstruction. I've had to do this many times. It's not that rare, right? So let's talk about if a single valve is stuck on, a single zone is running. Okay, remember to ask questions. Has there been any work done in the area? Has anyone else, such as a cable contractor, a pool installer, or landscaper, you know, done something and then perf performed the repairs themselves? You know, look around to see any evidence of work done. And what's happened occasionally when construction work has happened and a bundle of pipes have been cut through, a zone pipe is accidentally plumbed back into the main line and is causing it to run constantly. Now, that's a pretty rare occurrence. But I've seen it happen. I wouldn't be mentioning it unless I've seen it with my own eyes, okay? So, but let's check our timer first. Go to the timer. Is the timer running? There may be some, you know, bad settings, some errant settings in the timer that may appear that the zone is stuck on, but it's actually the timer that's keeping the zone running. Now, you know, you can look on the, you know, the, the screen to see if it's running visibly, like it'll have an icon flashing for a system running. Sometimes it's a little uh, sprinkler head flashing or whatever. You may see time counting on the zone. And if not, get out your multimeter and check to see if there's any voltage on the zone's terminals. It's possible that a circuit failure inside the timer is causing that zone to run, right? It's causing voltage to go to that particular zone. Now, in the absence of any timer or electrical issues, we know that the problem is physical, you know, mechanical with the valve. Let's look, then address the valve. Take the valve apart, check the diaphragm for tears or a warped, distended appearance. Look inside the lower valve body, stick your finger down in the hole to check for pebbles, any debris, or, you know, even any shards of broken PVC that you may see or feel down in there. You may need to turn the valve on for a couple of seconds just to try to flush out anything up through the pipes. And since you have the valve taken apart, I would go ahead and rebuild the valve if possible. 
If it's not a model that you know you've got parts for that you wouldn't rebuild, then reassemble it and see what happens. But you may need to replace the valve. Now our third troubleshooting scenario. A single zone has weak pressure. Generally this is caused by physical or mechanical issues, either a problem with the valve or problem with the pipe or a leak or something like that. Always walk the yard to ensure that you're not missing a pipe break or a missing or damaged head. And look closely. A missing sprinkler may not be shooting up into the air like a geyser. It may just be barely bubbling while it leaks out a ton of water and reduces the pressure in that zone. Be sure to check around the entire property. There may be a sprinkler or a drip line that was attached to that zone in a very improbable place. They just dug somewhere up, found a pipe, and added it to it there. I've seen it all the time. Also check the water meter to see if it's turning slowly or if it's turning as fast as any of the normally operating zones. That can be a good indicator there. Um, and ask the customer, always ask the customer if any recent repairs or additions may have been made to the irrigation system, particularly this zone, although they may or may not know the difference in the zones. That's kind of up to you to parse that information. And it's possible that an additional sprinkler two has been added to a zone, which has now exceeded the, the flow and velocity limits of the zone piping, making it appear like it has low pressure. It's just got too much flow going. And it's not also uncommon for larger nozzles to have been put on several of the heads to cover an expansion of beds or the turf area. It's also possible that some cable construction, landscaping installation or something has hit a pipe and crimped it, crushed it maybe with not, without actually breaking the pipe. And like I said before, just ask plenty of questions and look around for evidence of recent work on the property. They may not have even known it happened. Okay, so the next step is to locate the valve. We're going to troubleshoot the electrical side of the operations. It's probably not electrical in this chance. You know, solenoids are usually either open or they're closed. Open the valve up, see if there's any obstructions or problem with the valve. Rebuild or replace. And if the problem's still going on, now remove a head and turn the zone back on. It's possible that some repairs to the irrigation system or maybe even a break in the main water line upstream of your property has caused dirt, rocks, or debris to be pushed down into the irrigation system. I see it all the time, actually. And if so, like you'll be able to see, you know, when you take the head off, look down into the fitting, especially if it's a a barbed fitting, you know, uh, goes from maybe funny pipe to three quarter inch and the head screws down on it, you'll be able to see there. And normally that's the pinch point that's going to catch a lot of larger debris. But you can also disassemble the sprinkler head and look inside the filter to see if it's caught anything. And if so, then you're just going to need to take all of the heads off or maybe one at a time, however you want to do it, and flush those out. I normally put a, a nipple you know, with a threaded coupling on there to get it up and out of the hole so that when you turn the zone on, it just doesn't flood all the dirt back down into the hole and back down into your fitting.